issue. Um, I'll, I'll introduce our other two speakers before um, asking them to make some opening comment. Adrian Acosta, immediately to my right, is Chief Executive Officer of Journal Media, where he was also Chief Operating Officer for five years. Adrian is also Chair of the Native Advertising Council of the Interactive Advertising Bureau of Ireland, and he's a graduate of Columbia University. Um, Robert Pitt, uh, next beside Adrian, is Chief Executive of I I Independent News and Media. Uh, prior to join, I, joining INM as Chief Executive in late 2014, Mr. Pitt held senior management positions in the retail sector in Eastern Europe. Uh, in uh, Tesco, he was COO in the Czech Republic, prior to which he held the position of Managing Director of Tesco Franchise Stores in the Czech Republic and Operations Director Hypermarkets Tesco, Czech Republic and Slovakia. I hope that's broadly accurate. <laughs> so maybe we'll start with you, Robert. Um, you're a legacy publisher. You're um, the dinosaur. You're expected to be the uh, supporter of this copyright directive. Perhaps you'd give us your perspective, Robert, on what the comments you've heard and, your, uh, and the directive generally. Sure. Well, we're, we're not just a print publisher. We're also the, oh. the operator of the largest digital news platform in the country, uh, independent.ie. And, and successfully so. Yeah. Um, we're, we're very proud of our newspapers, as we are of our independent.ie, and, and the content that we, or the journalism that we put onto our newspapers and put onto our platform, we're very proud of that too, because a lot of uh, history, expertise, experience has gone into uh, creating that and making sure that we can stand over every day what we put in our newspapers and what we put in our online platform, and that's key to what we do. We don't uh, put content out there which we, doesn't, we don't think doesn't have a value either to the person who's reading it, in terms of if they want to buy the paper and reward us for that, or reading it and allowing us to monetize uh, around the advertising and on the online platform. And what we're seeing is um, the whole ecosystem has been very disrupted by fake news. And you refer to you know, the, the Trump election, uh, other events that have happened as well. Uh, you have not just fake news, but you could call it fake advertising as well, with the, the targeting on Facebook that came out about anti-Semitic advertising and very malign advertising. So it's a worrying uh, world out there. Yeah? And um, what I think uh, uh, we, we have to start looking at is uh, we cannot put the genie back in the bottle on this. Yeah? Uh, we are in a world dominated very much by, by two operators, uh, Google and Facebook, who have excellent platforms. Yeah? They have done an excellent job of allowing advertisers connect with the audiences that they need to reach with. And Google fo focus very much on intent, and what people are trying to find, what they're trying to do. And Facebook focusing on insight and uh, how people behave and so forth. You know? But we are the fuel that's driving the traffic on that. We are the people who are making people pick up their phone or pick up a newspaper and read content and, and read a piece and try to be informed. Where did people come once Trump was elected or once Brexit had happened? Our newspaper sales, our traffic actually went up because they were confused and they came to us and they wanted to read about the informed opinions about what's happening and to be reassured and to, to have insight. And we're a really crucial part of that whole e ecosystem. And um, I, I think uh, this thing about the, the snippets and uh, that, that's been tried, okay? And um, we, we cannot uh, do something which is going to make the world more complex. If I was looking for help on something now at the moment, or if I was looking for uh, a discussion in the environment that we're in. I'd be looking for people to help me do two things, uh, if it's Google or it's Facebook, it's to, to help find people who are willing to reward publishers such as us for good quality journalism to, to say, actually, I believe that what, what, what I've read there, it's helped me, it's given me insight, and I'd like to reward you for that. So we need the, we need the insight back from these giants uh, and, and, and from the world of, of the internet. And we also need to make it easier to, in some way, get a reward for that whether it's true advertising and the rate on advertising, or whether it's through some kind of paywall mechanism. Like, I don't think you'll find any uh, publisher who has a dogmatic uh, reason to object to a, a paywall or to monetization of content, because we invest an awful lot into it. We'd like to get rewarded for it. But something, and I'm very encouraged by the news in the last few days where we've seen that uh, Google are working with News Corp, for example, on, on helping to uh, make paid for content uh, easier, accessible, or easier to, to transact, transact with. That's a, that's a very positive step. These things will help, but it has to be simple because the whole uh, world of the internet is about removing friction. It's about making things simpler, allowing you to get to what you want quicker, and uh, we welcome that. Uh, journalism is read by more people than it ever was before. Our stories are more widely disseminated. We've earned more respect. There was the, the uh, Reuters report that came out that said, 
we have a trusted platform. We're very proud of that, and we will never give that up. And, and that's the line in the sand which I think all of us publishers will not go across. We will not enter into the fake news uh, uh, sector or, or arena. We're proud of what we do. We have too long a tradition in terms of publishing our paper since 1913 to, to, to give this away. And, and we're very resilient businesses. I don't think that we're going anywhere. We have challenge. We'll get through it and we'll move on and we're still going to be here and we're still going to have very good journalists reporting on very good stories and, and helping people. So. Excellent. So you're embracing the disruption and the disruption is sitting beside you here. Uh, uh, the classic journal media, um, you know, as a former politician myself, myself and Catherine are reflecting on some, some of the, uh, the comments on some of these uh, websites are very typical for us. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it has been a, a tremendous success and, 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 a, and, a, and some spin outs from it. So, Adrian, perhaps you would uh, give your experience of the last seven years of journal media and how you've broken through um, in, those, in, those, in those years. Okay, thank you for that. Um, thank you, Rich. Um, so, we've been publishing for seven years, and I think what uh, has worked for us was to um, accept that perhaps the, the distribution of information had changed fundamentally and there was no go back. So we had to focus in, a, um, in how to get to our readers in a different way. We didn't own the distribution anymore. We had to cater for how readers wanted to consume content as opposed to tell them, here's how you're going to consume content. And I think that's what worked for us. So we focused earlier on, on delivering uh, news for a digital platform, a platform that's likely to be mobile, a platform that's likely to be in social media. And I suppose in the context of, of, of this discussion, the, the, what's worrying about, for example, the, uh, the proposal for uh, uh, having to seek a license to uh, use the snippets of, of content is that it's more likely than not going to exacerbate the, the matter of um, using single sources or creating silos of information or creating misinformation even uh, because uh, it kind of shackles aggregators into uh, giving you an idea of what you're about to read should you choose to click on a link. So I would think that would be a very bad thing should that happen. Um, I think it would be a very bad thing for readers, first of all, uh, but also a very bad thing for publishers. Because um, ultimately, I don't think um, making news less accessible is something that will benefit publishers, even if there is a, a supposed modest fee going to uh, travel along uh, the value chain that way. Um, in terms of the other two items, the one about uh, data mining <coughs> and uh, the one about the filters, um, the one about data mining, I, I don't understand why it has to be so narrow, but that's just, so it's more a question than a comment, really. Uh, and the one uh, around um, filters, I suppose the concern is uh, what kind of um, empowerment and, and responsibility are we handing over to platforms? Yeah. Um, and what are the consequences of monitoring um, uh, content or enabling platforms to monitor content? Like it's, it's a really serious question. Um, and when you look at all three together, what, what you're seeing is, uh, or what, what I see anyway, is um, perhaps uh, an outlook that focuses more on, on business models that need to be kind of protected, uh, as opposed to, well, how are we using technology today? You know. Um, Technology, the, the, the two shifts of the last, say, 20 years, so a smartphone has only 10 years, right? <laughs> and then the internet, okay, a bit more, but um, from uh, uh, the point where we have a connected device that we carry with ourselves all the time, like, uh, that's it. Like you said, the, the genie's out of the bottle, that's <laughs> it. So what we need to do is we need to figure out how to work with that as opposed to put barriers that will impede new entries to the market, that will make things more complicated, that will uh, ultimately, um, in the context of news in particular, create more, more misinformation. Okay, yeah. thank you, Adrian. Um, maybe just to, uh, Catherine, to come back to you on uh, fleshing out the political context sure. of what's going on here. And you've said you, you know, it's great actually to hear the European Parliament is looking at this and from a citizen's point of view. Uh, very strictly, where the, where is the imperative coming from? Where do you find the battles you are? Where is the battlegrounds that you are having? 
And who are the personnel? I mean, we've heard from Roberts that he's sympathetic with, the, with, with your point of view, and he's sympathetic with the point of view of the publishers. We're actually going to build out that context. And also, where are we with the directive? How long is it going to take for it to, uh, to come into force? So in the 18 years I've been in the Parliament, I've never seen a lobby like this, particularly on um, issues around 11 and an issue around 13, which is um, not citizens orientated, but about protecting um, interests. Um, I, mean, I, I, I mean, Lisa will share with you, <laughs> Lisa who works with me, I mean, um, we had a vote in the Internal Market Committee in, um, in June, and up to 10 minutes before that vote, I didn't know whether that vote would take place or not. I managed to get consensus at 6 p.m. the night before. By 10 o'clock, it started to fold. And by the morning, when we got into the office at 7, um, we didn't know whether we'd actually get it through. And to just give you a picture of some of the lobbying, that is, that, that, that some people have a lot of money to put a lot of lobbying together. That's, I guess, why I felt that libraries need to have a say in some of this, because if you don't have some way to have a public voice, you're not going to have um, a balance in some of the debate. Um, but that week, um, my Spanish colleague had nine phone calls demanding certain ways to vote. And if we delayed it any longer, I, had, I, I mentioned that I managed to get success in 13, where we managed to get a compromise, but I lost nearly everything else. Um, and that was a real pity to me because in the Internal Market Committee, which is meant to be looking at the single market, you would think that you'd be able to get some things through. But on 13th, where we had a joint competence and the thing we actually mattered, the thing that we actually have joint responsibility for with the Legal Affairs Committee in the Parliament, so that when I'm in the negotiation, I can stand up for what the Internal Market had voted on, um, we, we got a good compromise and something that I hope will stick. But it's just, I, I, I mean, I, I've gone through, I mean, I, I worked on uh, tobacco, I've worked on, but I've never seen anything quite like this. The resource that's been put in, the way people are lobbied at, and it's also made me reflect as well, I have to be honest with you, about lobbying in the European Parliament, about people having access, about how lobbying is conducted, and I think there really has to be serious questions where people can roam corridors and um, target people. And also, it's not just the MEPs, it's the staff. I mean, our, our staff, the kind of abuse some people have been have taken um, is not good. And you, and you think, you know, people would learn lessons or lobbyists would learn. But it's for many, it's very high, you know, it's high stakes. Um, so uh, um, I'm very pleased that the vote in the Internal Market Committee took place. The reason there's delays in legal affairs is because there are you know, huge issues at stake and there's a new rapporteur because the, the existing rapporteur um, went, was elected to the Maltese Parliament and left. So that left a gap and it meant that the new rapporteur had to take up the file and also put things on that they would like to see and make the file their own as well. So that means that there's um, delays. So the vote is set in the committee for December. That would mean there were a vote in plenary probably, um, you know, kind of probably spring, early next year, but then that would go into a trilogue. And at the moment, if the council is divided and the parliament is divided, the idea that somehow we're going to get something through even this side of 2019 in this parliament then is put into question. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting moment, but also it's quite a worrying moment. If we can't even do reform and copyright and get something through, then the digital single market, for me, is really threatened. And I think that's a real pity because it's something that is transformative for the European economy and it's something that's meant to be central to the five-year plan of the Euro this uh, particular European Commission and it really needs to be taken more seriously. Yeah, such a critical uh, battleground. You've described it very well. Robert, you, you, you've kind of emphasised you, you want this legislation to be as simple as possible. And as an English language publisher, yeah. you know, it's, it's a different uh, experience for you uh, sure. competing you know, against publishers in Danish or yeah. Danish. Well, I, I, don't, I don't support the, 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 the snippets, the, the, the tax on snippets, that's called, yeah. Yeah? Okay, I don't think it's going to work. Yeah? Okay, I think a solution has to come along which uh, helps publishers you know, monetize or get rewarded uh, for what they do. Yes, for the English language, for us, it means that uh, our competition is the world. Uh, we compete uh, with American publishers, uh, English publishers. Um, we're uh, very, very vulnerable. A lot of, uh, you've heard my experience, I've worked in Germany, Czech, Slovakia, China, 
language protects them an awful lot. Uh, it's very, very uh, closed environment you're in, and we're very, very exposed to that. Yeah. But on the other hand, we get quite a lot of traffic from the UK, and we get quite a lot of traffic from the US as well, so we, we can monetize that. It offers us opportunity. And this is, I think this is the point, yeah, is that the world has changed, and it's up to us to take advantage of that as well as we can. And our businesses, whether we're only here for seven years or we're here for 100 years, we, we're, we've shown that we will do that. Yeah. What I would like to see is, I would like to see simpler ways to do this, simpler ways to engage directly with customers. So, for example, what I referred to with Google about um, you know, sites that are behind paywalls, that's a very interesting uh, uh, move. Uh, that, uh, traditionally, they were ranked very, very low. Now they're being put up near the top of the, uh, the search listings. Uh, well, does that offer a way that longer term most more of us can monetize directly with the customer and the customer can tell me I value your content not some kind of overall tax on the internet where everybody's getting tired of the same brush you have to reward people for the quality of what they do for the integrity of their journalism that's the really important bit it can't be communism uh, yeah, so <laughs> it's kind of a, a strange word to use but like that everybody's getting rewarded the same but it has to be that the people who do their job, do their job will get rewarded well and that's what I'd like to see and then the other bit which is really important and I think Google and Facebook and others can help us is the data they have on people. They know what people think, how they behave, and they can bring people to us who will be more inclined to spend more time with us, maybe reward us directly, but, or reward us uh, by engaging more with our advertisers, which leads to higher yield on the advertising that we have. I mean, that's really important, the data that's there, because we're helping create that data. And, Legally, it belongs to Google, but it can be shared, it can be invested back in. It, you, know, you can have investment back into our industry, which is the DNI initiative, which is very welcome. But you can also invest back in by sharing with us what you know and uh, how we can use that to widen our audience, deepen the engagement that we have with people. You know, so. And you've identified a story that's been, I think, it was in one of the newspapers this morning about uh, um, the thaw, maybe, in the relationship between the publishers and Google and Facebook in relation to. Uh, assisting publishers in finding ways to monetize through the use of their algorithms seems yes. to be uh, yeah. an emerging story yeah. uh, at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Adrian, perhaps uh, you could uh, comment on this. I mean, do you, do, 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 is your business model uh, a, a stable, sustainable business model? All the focus is on the more traditional uh, publishing uh, platforms. What, what, what about uh, digital only like yourself? Well, uh, I think that the challenge is a challenge to all publishers, whether they're um, print uh, or digital or both. And we were talking earlier on ab about broadcasters as well. Like, I mean, fundamentally, again, distribution has changed, and platforms have managed to do a terrific job there. And you know, they their their model is more efficient and is taking uh, the lion's share of um, of advertising, which was the main pillar of funding for both uh, um, print publishers and digital, digital publishers. So the challenge is, well, how do we work with these platforms and how do we maintain uh, a quality of, of service that, that, that we want to offer? Um, and there are two ways of doing that, I think. One is through advertising and the other one is through, through subscription. And these uh, <laughs> two platforms, there's, there's more actually. I actually think that, that Apple, Apple News, for example, is also one worth considering. And I think in the very near future, Amazon as well is worth considering, particularly in terms of uh, connectivity with, with um, home items. Um, so, uh, you know, there's four or five platforms that are the, the ones that, um, uh, that uh, are the dominant platforms, and we have to work with them to. Um, because they have the main relationship with the with the audience, and we just need to figure out different ways of of uh, creating uh, a new way of doing business with this with these platforms. So okay. I, I believe it is sustainable to mm -hmm. answer your question. Mm -hmm. yes. I just think that we hard to say anything else uh, this morning. <laughs> in fairness. I I just don't believe that that uh, it has been fully figured out, okay. and I don't believe that the the. I, I think we're still in flux. I don't think that, okay, smartphone, we're done now. <laughs> this, uh, I think there are new things coming that can be shifts that are nearly as significant as, as mobile. Okay.